Welcome back to The Big Show. It's always nice to talk to a legend and a true star. Clive James, how are you? Well, I'm thrilled at being called a legend. It sounds <laughs> as if I should be wearing a kind of fur coat. It becomes a legend most, you know. For me, you were one of the premier interviewers and really you've got this new book out that talks about your time on TV talking to people like I'm talking to you. Yeah, the new book, The Blaze of Obscurity, is really about my time in television. And I spent a lot of that time, of course, talking to people. And uh, I had my own ideas about how that should be done. Uh, I never really used the adversarial technique. I used to, uh, I used to uh, bowl softballs and see how they would hit them, and that's often when the the person you're talking to will let something slip. Uh, but I, I very rarely interviewed anyone I didn't respect. Occasionally, I, I name no names. <laughs> Occasionally, I wanted to strangle them on the way in, <laughs> but usually they got they got well known for a reason. Those were the days when you still got famous for a reason. We're now in a different era where you get famous for anything, right? <laughs> And I don't particularly want to interview Jordan, for example, even if I was asked to. It is funny, and I know Parky, when he left ITV, he said the good old days of TV have gone because the people I want to talk to don't want to talk anymore, yes. and those who do, I don't want to talk to them. I, he was dead right uh, because uh, the stars were getting increasingly more tightly handled by their minders for understandable reasons. If you've got a valuable property, you don't want the valuable property to say the wrong thing. So you try and block that off. And uh, that, and combined with the fact that the people who would speak freely didn't have anything to say, was a deadly double blow. What do you make of the world these days? I mean, if you were doing your show now and you could have anybody on, who would you want on and what would you ask Well, there's a lot of material around. The great days of President Bush are gone. President Bush would create new material for you every time he opened his mouth. Uh, His inadvertent humour was the very highest class. Obama's not going to do that for you. Uh, Obama's just too 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 bright. And Obama's actual master of the language. His first book, Dreams from My Father, is a great book. We're gonna, what we're going to find out in the next eight years, or it could be four, is whether you want a great writer to be president of the United States. That's mm-hmm. really going to change the way the world works, how how that plays out. Um, but no, there's, a, there's a lot of stories about it, but who would I want on? It's a very, very good question. I usually like appreciate most the people who, who make things. Often they're making them in a sort of not very spectacular way, but they're getting things done. Sometimes the really, really big people just don't want to be on television. Television isn't everything. But isn't that great, though, that the mystery is there with them? I almost regret the fact that we know too much and yeah, that, that people say yes when you ask to interview. I would like to get some of my mystery back. In fact, there's a lot of mystery because Clive James doesn't really exist. I'm a hologram. <laughs> And uh, the actual me is sitting somewhere else in a secluded <laughs> castle. There's plenty of mystery. It's just that I can't reveal it. You understand? No, but there's something to be said for that. Some of the really big film stars were always careful not to do, not to be interviewed. Al Pacino was like that. Harrison Ford has always been like that. Harrison Ford has nothing to say, so it's very wise of him not to be interviewed. <laughs> but Pacino always worked on the principle that every time he went on television to publicizing publicize a movie, as the studios wanted him to do, of course then he was detracting from the very quality that made people go to see him in the cinema, made him too available. There's something to it. You do feel terrifically available after 20 years in the media. I retired in 2000, <laughs> and now I'm feeling unavailable and mysterious and wrapping my beautiful shoulders in fur. I'm legendary. Is there a feeling that when somebody like me asks for an interview, you're thinking, I'm just too good to talk to the likes of me? Oh, no, I like the likes of you. Uh, <laughs> it's the, the likes of some of the people in the press that scare me to death. <laughs> they still send these harridans after me who, who treat me as if I was a politician, an elected official. I just hate them. And one of these days, I'm going to knock one of them off. You know? <laughs> one, of the, one, of, one of them is just going to vanish. She's going to come to my place to interview me, and she's not going to go back. <laughs> That'll be a story. Because it is a PR world now, and that's the difference between the days when you spoke to people. You really were talking to them. Yes. It does seem now when you interview people, you're talking kind of vacuously through their eyes, through their PR, yeah. through the person who media trained them. You don't really get the real person. You're talking to a corporation, and you better be ready for that on the way in. Because unless you're very careful, you're just getting incorporated into their enterprise. And what you want to do is incorporate them into yours. But yeah, it's all irreversible. People know too much about all the rules now. And uh, to the point where you can make a joke of it. Most of the TV programs that we laugh at are parody TV programs about other TV programs. People are very media wise. That's what wears me out. It's sometimes a relief to get off the plane, usually a small plane in some country where they have not got advanced media and get back to human relationships. Because we've lost the plot in a sense that everybody now wants to be a star. Yes. And they don't really know what they want to be famous for, but they you'll just want to be a star. Kid, you'll see kids being interviewed on the streets of New York in, say, 
in, in, in Harlem or Spanish Harlem and they'll ask the kids uh, what do you want to be when you grow up and they say famous what do you want to do next well I want to get famous uh, what do you think you could be really good at I could be good at being famous it doesn't occur to them that on the whole it would be wiser and better for the world and for them if they actually did something in order to earn this fame. You've done so much and you've known so many great people. Princess Diana, let's cover that for a start because you were a huge fan, weren't you? Uh, yes, I adored her. But I, I, thought she, I thought she wasn't entirely stable when I first knew her. Uh, but on the other hand, she was fascinating. And to the objection, well, if she'd been a, a checkout girl at Tesco, she wouldn't have been interested. The answer is, oh yes, I would. She <laughs> was, she was, uh, she was riveting. Uh, what nobody expected, and this is going to be the hardest thing to tell the next generation. Nobody really expected she would die. Nobody knew that. So the idea that it was all leading up to that—that is—that is wisdom by hindsight, which isn't wisdom at all. We all thought she was going to live. She would have made a marvellous queen. I saw myself as a very, very old man being called to the palace and required by her to tell the same old jokes that she'd always <laughs> liked. I adored her. There's no, no disguising it. And, of course, she's still being written about today. Does that break your heart? No, it doesn't, although I'm very, very sorry to see the same people who were, were, who were earning a pound a word for writing about her when she was alive are still earning a, a pound a word about her when, she, when, when she's dead. There's no end to it. The thought that there are people in the building consuming their lives doing this is somehow very, very touching, don't you find? I mean, it's a compliment in one way. I feel it's the same with Michael Jackson. I can't see them stop writing about him I don't, either. You know, I, don't, I don't see the point with him. I, I think he only had four or five hits. He wasn't even the Tamla star that really counted. But I thought the whole business of his life, uh, the mere business of his operations on his skin was enough to make you cry with pity. It was frequently proposed I do a documentary about him. I, I, I veto that not interested. So was it always personal with you then? Did you always decide who no, you interviewed? I have to like what they do and although I liked the way he danced to Billie Jean and, and a few other things, it just didn't interest me very much and I thought he was well on the way to being a tragedy quite early on. The minute where his face start, started to alter I thought this is undoing 200 years of black progress. I mean, whatever contributed to the climate change of climate by which Barack Obama became president, which is a very welcome development in history. It undoes a great historic wrong. Whatever contributed to that, Michael Jackson did not contribute. It. Michael Jackson contributed the opposite. He looked like a man who was ashamed to be black. No, I didn't want to interview him. And, uh, and, and but wouldn't I, you be curious, because you're such a bright man, and it would I have been leave interesting... Leave to other bright men. <laughs> but wouldn't you have been women. curious to put that to him? Asking an awkward question is no way to find out the truth on television. Well, I'm a believer in that. There's no point asking a question that you know you're not going to get an answer to. You can ask it 15 times, and everyone will throw their hands up in the air and say, Hurrah, he's Jeremy Paxman. <laughs> but if you listen carefully, you'll notice that the person being asked the question didn't answer it. <laughs> so you're none the wiser, and they won't talk to you again. <laughs> I suppose you've got to be in a position of power to get away with those types of questions. And yeah. you were. I mean, in your day, as we read in this book, The Blaze of Obscurity, you were it. I mean, you were at the top of your game no, and you I could think, get I, who you picked. Parkey was always number one because Parkey was on the BBC. And, and while we were both on the BBC, Parkey was still the number one interview show. And so really you were, you were competing for what... The Parky show either didn't want or it already had, but they didn't mind doing it again. So, but the center, the center of the, the center of the equation, was always the Parkinson show. But I was quite content with where I was, and uh, I, I talked to some marvelous people. I, I loved it. Pe people like Peter O'Toole. It's such a pleasure to talk to. I learned things from them, especially in the green room. Peter O'Toole said, "Have you ever seen?" the paintings of W.B. Yeats's brother, Jack B. Yeats, and I hadn't. So after that I did, and it was a life-changing experience, things like that. Uh, no, I loved it all, but uh, I wouldn't say it's a position of power. Uh, you, What you're doing is entertainment, and that's not powerful. And uh, the person with the power is the person sitting in the other chair. They're, they are conceding to you. They are condescending to visit you. And the bigger the stars they are, the more they're condescending. And they're bound to be aware of it. Uh, I, I could name many names that I was very, very, very pleased to have settling into the seat opposite me. But I was very, very conscious that my job was to help go on making them look good. 
there was simply no future in, in proving that the great film star opposite you was just a frail human being. The, the, the great film star opposite you is not just a frail human being. The great film star opposite you is, first of all, a great film star. Mm. So if I'm going to talk to anyone, I'd rather talk in my living room, in the comfort of my living room. So I don't even have to go into the car and go somewhere else. Clive, it's been lovely meeting you. It's such a thrill because you are a true legend of <laughs> Alex, TV. You're too kind. No, no, I'm serious. And the website <laughs> is worth visiting at www.clivejames.com. And the new book, The Blaze of Obscurity, is your 32nd autobiography. And it's the one I've had. It's the 32nd <laughs> book, the fifth volume of autobiography. And I've never had more fun than this one. I, uh, and it's usually a good sign if you have a lot of fun writing mm. a book, then the, the, the readership might enjoy reading it. But it made me fall out of my chair, so maybe it'll do the same for you, folks. I wish I could be you because you've <laughs> met so many people and asked so many interesting questions, and you're so much smarter than me. How, how can I ask that one? <laughs> Clive, thank you. I have no answer. <laughs>